speaker. I, I'm going to try to dash through everything I have to say because I have to say that I come in um, representation of the lab. We have a new geoarchaeology lab which we uh, are still trying to set up. We're still we're already working on um, producing data, which I'm going to present to you today. But you'll see that it's mostly preliminary, largely unpublished, and uh, in any case, we would like to share it at every step of the way. So um, I'm going to to try to incorporate as many uh, highlights of the different areas that we're touching in the lab as possible. Um, our motivation in this lab, uh, I'm just going to uh, quickly mm, tell you that I'm going to explain to the what, what this lab is about and then I'm going to uh, give you some examples of that are both in, in archaeological domain as well as the experimental domain, what we are working on, right? So what is our motivation? The lab was designed based on the need for uh, help doing site formation studies and based on uh, the microstratigraphic context, which here we have uh, had very beautiful examples of how important it is to look at microstratigraphy in order to approach the human scale. It is really hard to do uh, when you're talking about site formation, site-specific processes, not to uh, look at the microstratigraphy if you want to really narrow down the time scale and the, the pace if we've seen if we've seen changes happening in months in your experiments, you know, it, it, we, it's a really fast pace that takes really centimeters of time that need this microstratigraphic work. So we are strong believers in the microstratigraphic approach, microcontextual approach in the lab, and we are strong believers in in the context of it. So not only working at small scales, but working in undisturbed samples where you have the context in place. This has also been said before today. The novel approach is the organics, which we, uh, you know, I read the literature and I always find, well, but it's, it's actually, we are moving forward. People are doing it. But today, you know, I, I find myself, I'm, I'm the first one that's gonna start talking about organics today after a very long day of very interesting talks. So let's see tomorrow, because today was the older chronologies, we'll see. But our motivation was this, was uh, there is so much organic record and it's preserved in the sediments, right? And they tell a big part of the story, of the human story. So it's very frustrating to just remain at the descriptive level. And we are very good with um, high resolution techniques at describing it even, even further. But uh, I think that we, we can go, uh, we can exploit more of the techniques than we are doing currently. And I'm speaking about geoarchaeology in general, the, the discipline, okay? We, we are slowly getting into the organic realm, but I think that there's techniques at hand that, that are underused at present. And all it takes is getting started, right? Like we're doing. So um, this is what we're gonna do. We, we're, we're set up to not lose the context. You know, we are um, uh, shifting the focus on uh, analyzing these things that we, these particles or these bits of matrix that we just don't know what it is and we can go beyond saying something organic and it's probably burned or humified. And that's that's very common that we run into that a lot. So we are uh, using the, the thin section of the block, um, hopefully directly in the beginning, we are just sampling uh, side uh, side by side our blocks uh, to have microstratigraphic control of the samples we collect in bulk. In the future, we would like to directly analyze the thin sections on blocks to carry out organic analysis. So uh, when I said exploit further techniques, I really mean techniques that are not really new. Uh, gas chromatography uh, coupled to mass spectrometry is not new, but it is rare for, uh, for sedimentary, uh, archaeological sedimentary context. Especially when we're going back in the past, um, my group focuses in the Paleolithic, there is really underused these techniques in the sediments. And for more recent chronologies, it's more frequent for residue analysis, for example. So what we're targeting is really identify compounds, big molecules, and uh, we're, we're shooting for molecules rather than elements and minerals, right? Um, and we do this through grass chromatography because we, uh, you will see, we're focusing on lipids because they're hydrophobic, so they are uh, have a higher preservation potential. And 
Uh, we are also relying on the vibrational spectroscopy techniques, which don't give us the whole molecule, but are kind of complement. They reinforce uh, our interpretations. They, they help out a lot in, in getting us the chunks of those molecules, at least. So I'm just going to shoot off and start giving you some examples of the recent stuff that we've started to work on. I'm not going to touch micromorphology, which is what I do. And basically, part of the reason is because the lab is new, so most of the thin sections are not even ready. And we're starting with the chemistry. So this is what it is. So, but bear with me, because it's not my turf. So we're starting with this little example. I'm going to not give you a whole case study. It's just little highlights of examples of different projects. Okay. So this case is uh, in one of the Canary Islands. Our lab is in Tenerife, so it's, it's uh, nearby relatively nearby. And it's very interesting because it's a site where uh, they have agriculture and sedentary uh, societies, up to 4,000 people living there in Aboriginal times before the, the Europeans came to the islands, which is very interesting and very little is known. So we set out to collaborate with them to try to figure out, help them figure out uh, things like construction techniques, which they haven't got a grip on yet or uh, even the use of, the, of some of the structures because they have generally assumed things of what the rooms were used for. So this is one of the case studies we're working on and we collected a lot of blogs and we have a lot of these massive black features that you can't tell what they are, right? You would say, oh yes, yeah, some, something burned, something charred. It's just black, it's black sediment. Black, silty, massive. Morphologically, that's all you can say. And so, um, because our approach is the lipid analysis before we do anything else, that's what we did, right? We did lipids. So just to show you, this is like a typical uh, N-alkyne profile, the hydrocarbons is the simpler, simplest uh, building blocks of, of the organic uh, lipids. So that's what they, they're most abundant and they are very, they, they can be very informative because all plants have them and then you can, well, tell apart different kinds of plants according to the different alkyne profile that you have. So that's the, the, the most basic analysis that we can do. We did an uh, alkaline analysis, and the alkynes show us already they are guiding us towards these are plants, and these are vascular, higher plants, terrestrial plants. This we know because of uh, the distribution of those alkynes in the pro along the profile. So we have alkynes that have long carbon chains, uh, and the long carbon chain profiles that uh, is given to us by this ACL value, the average chain length is, is how long the chains of carbons are. And normally when they're uh, uh, very long and they have this pattern of odd even uh, predominance, which is given to us by the CPI, by the Car Car Carbon Preference Index, we can point uh, at woody plants in this case, right? This is what we have. We also have a predominance of uh, one particular chain length, which is uh, 29 carbons, that also points to us that these are woody. Yeah, these are some of the things that we can just see just looking at the, at the alkene profile. We also have the fatty acids. It's another lipid fraction. We, have, we analyze different lipid fractions, right? With, uh, uh, lipids have different uh, uh, polarities, and we can extract them according to their polarity. They go from more apolar, um, like the hydrocarbons, saturated hydrocarbons, and to the more polar, like alcohols and, and diols. So here, the, fat, the fatty acids uh, would be towards the polar, towards another lipid fraction that we can analyze. They're more complex, normally more uh, branched, and they biodegrade more often. So especially for Paleolithic, people are very wary of interpreting them. But here we're in Gran Canaria. This is Aboriginal. It's uh, maybe, mm, yes, this would be like 1400 AD, so it's OK. So here we're looking at biodegradation, and this is uh, given to us by, by, by the, these fatty acids uh, that have uh, chains of, of 16 carbons. And we also can see corroborated our, our interpretation on the vascular higher plants because the fatty acids also align well to where they should for the higher plants. So this is just another fraction, just these are examples, right, of more information. And when we look at the alcohols and other fractions, uh, like the aromatic fraction, uh, we can also get some clues as to what is that. Now we know that they're higher plants, terrestrial plants, 
And we have compounds, like here you have a bunch of compounds um, um, that also tell you that they're higher plants. You also have clues that they might be flowering plants, angiosperm, like the betulin. Is a, it's a, a, an alcohol that usually tells you that. There's germanical, lupeol, that tells you that they're coastal plants. And uh, that wouldn't be surprising in Gran Canaria, right? But there's also, for those of you that have been there, there's a lot of difference between the mountain environments and the coastal environments in the islands and the way that people exploited them. So, so it's something that is good to know. And something that basically for our interest, it narrows down our interpretation, which is we, we, all we ask is, what is that black stuff? So th this is a lot of information that we can obtain. We can obtain carotenoids, right? So we know that it's some kind of fruiting plants, uh, orange or red, right? And then all this information, and sorry, let me conclude with this, just saying that we are closer to know it what our black silty stuff that could be just otherwise humified or charred organic matter is. Um, we, uh, as a preliminary conclusion, think that that stain, those patches, and there are several of them in that room, are just biodegraded. We know that there is biodegradation from the bacterial action, biodegraded plant material, and plant material of an unknown species, an unknown characteristic, but we don't think it's charred. Also by uh, absence of some compounds, like when you have charred material, especially in recent chronologies, you have a lot of aromatic compounds developing, forming, so there's compounds that from, form from burning, and we didn't have any of those here. Also, the alkane profile showed the typical, uh, the, the alkane profile of those terrestrial plants, which showed the CPI, where I showed you the car carbon preference index of odd and even predominance. Normally with plants that are burned, that gets smoothed a lot, and the long chains break. We didn't see any of that. So that black stain there stain on the ground, for now we are now interpreting it as something that doesn't look to be burned. It'll be interesting to see the thin section. I suspect that maybe in the thin section we just see a black matrix and we might just see, hmm, could be humified or could be charred. But maybe there's a surprise when we see tissue, we'll see, I'll let you know. <laughs> so moving on really quickly, this is a beautiful case study that is work in progress, almost done, but still work in progress of a PhD student, Natalia Eges. And she is working in Mongolia. She's doing some ethnoarchaeological work, trying to uh, characterize from a multi-proxy microcontextual perspective the, the, the material fingerprint, sedimentary fingerprint of stables. And this is really useful for, there's some talks that we've seen today of how useful it could be to have like a pattern of what a stable looks like in this kind of environment. In this case, she's um, sampling across Mongolia, three different very environmental contexts because she goes from grassland forest to grassland to semi-desert. And for studies set in Bronze Age, Neolithic, where um, we have similar comparable settings, environmental settings, and we have no architecture, we know that they were shepherds, it would be great if we could just collect samples and know what to look for, right? Know what, what proxies we need to to look for, to say where we are and what diet the, these animals had. So she's doing the micromorphology, which, okay, that it's obvious it's done, we know what it looked like, but in this case, it's very interesting to have it because, well, in all cases, but in this specific case, if you have a bioturbation, for example, inside this table, you have dung, but if you have a lot of roots or bio, root bioturbation in the dung, and you're going to do isotopic studies, whether it's bulk or compound specific, it, they can have some influence on your results. So it's always important to have this, the Google Maps, as I say, the thin section and know where you are at. Is this preserved? Is this in situ? And then you can go on to do the chemistry, which is what we do here. So uh, very quickly, what she did for now was also the hydrocarbons and alkanes. She hasn't analyzed the other fractions yet, but the N alkanes have, has already given her, given her pattern of what to what what the that dung is made of, and this here is important, and I didn't mention in the beginning that she's looking at the, the sample that I'm showing you here is from the South Step area of her analysis, and the South Step is a is a a step, and uh, but it's in in Mongolia. It's it's a really cold step, so in the winters there is really really cold. It gets a minus 50 degrees and the snow cover and everything. So it's shepherds that live there and the animals 
produce these dung layers on these cold steps. And it's not clear, this is an archaeological work of samples collected in the summer from, from winter camps. And it's not clear what they feed, the, the, do they go through big ordeals to save grass for their animals for the winter? Or, and here you have the proof because these, uh, these um, Enakin profiles show you a predominance of, of long chains uh, with peaks on 31 that tell you that these are grasses. It's interesting that, that through this we can know that they are feeding them grasses, even if it's in the, in the middle of the winter. She has some um, complemented this with stable isotope research that is very interesting too because it's compound specific. So we are uh, picking out the, the delta-13 carbon of the grass inside the dung pellets. And, and this is interesting because we are uh, characterizing a profile for this kind of uh, uh, stepic settings and where it hasn't really been done. And uh, Natalia is finding really interesting things that still need to be interpreted. But I'm just very briefly tell you that the values that she finds for, for isotopes that are, you know, like along the 30, 34 or so, it's quite low. It's, it's really, uh, it, plants uh, create uh, depleted complexes, right? Uh, they, they deplete carbon-13, but not that much. It was expected more to be on the order of 28 or so. And this is interesting because this pattern is it's a pattern called recycling. It's, it's like they they re, they it, it's an uh, a recycling and reuptaking <laughs> of of biogenic carbon that has been documented like in tropical context where there's lots and lots of plants, lots of lignin, lots of cellulose, and then the plants that are degrading are recycling and using the CO2 of the other plants that are degrading there that is already depleted. So they have more depletion. In this case, the plants, the grasses that are degrading are recycling the depleted uh, carbon CO2 from the dung, which has grass that is depleted. So it's kind of a new isotopic signature profile that is characteristics of, of uh, dung soil, say, so to speak, that, that she's getting into with this. So this is uh, her study so far. Now we're, work, we're waiting on the other um, areas of, of the step that she's analyzing. And pff, no way. OK. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to start speaking faster. Tomorrow, you can see this poster uh, by one of our grad students, uh, Lucia Lairis, who is working in middle paleolithic context. And she's in trying to dissect palimpsest of when situations where you have many multiple overlapping fireplaces um, on the same occupation surface, and at the same time <coughs> trying to get at fire use and try to distinguish uh, different fire uses in this context. And you can also visit another poster by Rory Connolly, um, who is trying to have a, a, a paleoenvironmental approach you know, or uh, use of these methods of these tools that we use. And he is going to try to use uh, compound-specific uh, isotope analysis to get reconstruct uh, paleohydrology and climate in the Neanderthal context, where it's it's really needed. It's some sites that uh, there is hypotheses about climate change, and and we really need uh, good uh, sampling with good intervals to get at it. So this is another poster that you can visit uh, tomorrow. And then we get to the experiments in five minutes. Okay. The experiments are the most exciting part because it's meta development, right? So this experiment, um, can I go a little bit over time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the, this experiment is, uh, we, we are trying to expand what we know about thermal degradation or, and, and, uh, and to test the stability of these molecules in the past, right? Because so little has been done. So paleoclimate people, they work a lot on compound specific stuff and isotopes, but all they care about is reconstructing the paleohydrological regime and they don't get into thermal degradation. We work with char, we work with burnt things because just they're ubiquitous in archeology span in all time periods. So we need to get at them. So this study here, what we try to do is based on the assumption that when we have a black layer in the fireplace, it can either be the fuel or the substrate, how to tell it apart, right? And we figured, well, what if uh, geochemically the, the, the compounds that uh, are characteristics of leaves and branches are different? That would be great, because then you could distinguish uh, litter 
for, that was under the fire from the from the fuel itself. So that's what the, was done. And indeed, we, we, it's not mentioned here, but this experiment concerned Celtis australis, this huckleberry tree that is very common in one side that we study. And indeed, what we see here is that, the, well, what we see here is just the characteristic pattern of Celtis, which uh, for, for unburned, for fresh, which um, was corroborated. It, it was uh, studied before, so it's not new. But then, well, what we can also see is that burning at different uh, intervals, uh, 100 degrees intervals, this pattern only changes in 350. So it's stable. So up to 350, it, meaning in all of the black layers, you could still identify that Celtis was there. And you can see that, that it was leaves, not wood in that case. Okay. So And then you can also see, which is interesting, that 450 is more or less a threshold where things change and that the, the, the pattern becomes really, really different. And for the branches, first thing, it's different from the leaves, which is cool, because palate climate people, they don't analyze branches, they don't care about them, right? So they were, it was undocumented. So this is something we can track. We can differentiate uh, leaves from bark. And branch bark, I mean, the, including the bark, the external part of the branches. Uh, another thing uh, is that overall um, they have less al and, and alkynes, less uh, hydrocarbons, uh, less cellulose maybe than, in, than the leaves. So the leaves have considerably more bulk alkynes than branches. That's another uh, point. And also they are less stable thermally. So when you burn them, I guess that's why they're good fuel, right? They burn faster. They at 200 degrees, they are. 250 degrees, you can already see big changes in their in their patterns. What those changes are, we're still, uh, this is very complicated. Here, there's an enrichment. It might be from degradation of other stuff that leaves don't have on branches, yes. So this is a, a story that has to be continued. And then moving on to animal experiments. Uh, that's for the plants. The animals, the same thing. We have done a lot of studies with experiments with wood fire. But bone fires, not so much. And I, at least for the Paleolithic, it's really interesting because uh, there is, especially in glacial periods uh, where there's absence of wood, there's a lot of hypotheses about bone use as fuel. And it's very interesting to know more about, uh, about if, whether we can identify these uh, animal bone and meat burning products in the sediments. So that's what we're targeting. We're doing experiments and also uh, lab controlled uh, field experiments with fire, sorry, and lab control experiments burning just the bone and the, and the meat to see to see what we what we can find. And basically, what we are targeting is to to see what is special about the compound profile in the sediment of a of a bone fire versus a wood fire, particularly whether we have uh, fats that are that are incorporated into the substrate, which is something that uh, we don't know. Uh, if, if they drip down and if they preserve, even if not morphologically, because if you don't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there. And then another thing is to identify uh, pyromarkers of compounds uh, that are formed from the burning of fat, which which has been documented before. So the, it's already known that, that there are certain compounds that form through burning of 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 the fatty acids and they, they are newly formed compounds. But their stability, their degree of preservation, when they form exactly, that is not understood clearly. So that is one of the aims. And this work has been already started in this direction. This is just to show you that the, that the, the kind of compounds that we can find that are produced by burning. So like, for example, long chain ketones. Ketones is another uh, kind fraction of a lipid that is a little bit more complex than a hydrocarbon. And uh, these uh, long chain ketones, they form, they form with fire when you, when, the, with, when you burn or when you condense palmitic acid and stearic acid, which are like building blocks of animals and plants, they're everywhere. When you burn them, you find these long chain ketones. So our target is to find them in the sediments. So we did. So this is good news. So then the first step, initial steps of, of analysis, we know that they're there, and we're, we know that they're there in depth. So we're finding them like up to two centimeters uh, into the black layer, and then in the brownish sediment under the black layer, they're also there. These ketones that come from experimental fires where we burn bone and with, uh, with a little bit of fat, with fresh bone, 
um, on it. So we know that they're there. Now the next thing is going to be to uh, analyze their stable isotopes because that's the really interesting thing. So the, their presence has been documented, but uh, we don't know if their isotope uh, are also their isotopic signature is stable through burning because it's the isotopic signal that is going to help you tell apart between different animals, for example, because or different whether you have a plant or an animal because the ketones form form any uh, kind of life form, but the, the stable isotopes are the ones that are going to help you further differentiate. The stability of those is what we are targeting next. Um, more experiments. Um, this is more uh, method developing experiments geared at uh, what I tell you before. We want to analyze the blocks and the thin sections directly. So we want to basically drill out some particle that we don't know what it is or some matrix, right? And that's our goal. So we have the resin problem that the resin, polyester resin and polystyrene that we use to impregnate the blocks is organic and is very complex molecules that are usually interfering, right? So that's one problem we have. Good news in the first, very first steps that we have made, uh, managed so far, is that the resin doesn't seem to be such a problem. First of all, because uh, we're not talking about lipids in the resin, there are such large molecules that the chromatographer doesn't have a problem with them, he just doesn't see them. So the, the main peaks that we want to identify uh, in this case of the experiment we did is, is just uh, some fatty acids, some acids, and they, they, they were there. And they were there in the same positions. I mean, here you don't see them exactly in the same positions because uh, we were doing the run and the column broke, so we had to cut it, and this kind of distorts the, the spectra. But trust me, they're in the same positions. And for the sample that was just like salmon char, and a piece of just salmon skin that we charred, just bulk, and the same thing, but uh, embedded, just in an in a embedded block, the polish uh, that came from a thin section. So this is very good news uh, that we have to work on uh, further. And because this was, uh, if I am correct, it was, was about 500 milligrams, we have to bring it down more and more and more. Because if our goal is to uh, drill out a very small particle, we are going to need to have this kind of result in a very small sample as well. So that's where we're at. And then finally, um, now finally, I promise, this is another experiment that we want to, we want to really explore Raman because Raman is so good with uh, apolar molecules, uh, with lipids, because it likes them, right? It doesn't have uh, such, um, such water molecules. So the problem of the resin is also in Raman here. And the problem of the resin with Raman is that the resin is very fluorescent. So we have, uh, uh, we, especially Glenn Armbrecht, one of our postdocs, is starting to work on trying to solve this problem. And uh, he also has good news for now. Uh, the good news is that the, uh, you can see the Raman signal uh, even in the resin. So the Raman is very fluorescent, but the fluorescence does not mask the Raman signal. You can still see it. You can, uh, you can tell it, you, you can see it, it's here. I mean, this is um, raw data, you know, there's no background. There's all this noise here, it's from the fluorescence. And the, the Raman signal is visible. So we did some tests, you know, to it like uh, a, a limestone grain that is embedded in the thin section, just to see if we if we get what we're supposed to get, and we do. So it's fluorescent, but it's fine. And then in the charred bone, we get funky stuff, but it's fluorescent because it's hydrolux hydroxyapatite, which is because it's bone, and it's a bone that maybe not burn at very high temperature. Um, and it still doesn't show any of the like, graphite peaks or any peaks from aromatics that, that would be necessary there. We still don't know that. that. That is a funky result that we have to look at, why that is fluorescent, but it's anyways fluorescent, not because of the resin. So, so here for now, this is also good news and that we have to move forward to. So we have a lot ahead and I tried to like illustrate as much as I could because um, not all of us could come to this conference, obviously. So I apologize for going so fast and uh, I hope to continue filling uh, you in with stuff uh, as we get it. So thank you everyone. And thanks especially the members.